Patrick, thank you so much for joining me this morning. Super stoked to be here. Thanks. I was going to say, we better start recording because I'm going to just talk here. You're like a, it's like meeting an old friend and you're just like, oh my God. Just blah, 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 blah. So <laughs> it's like, I better hit record. <laughs> Obviously a good chemistry. <laughs> right, right. Um, well, I'm so excited to talk to you because as we were chatting before I hit record, um, I have been wanting to interview somebody from refuge recovery for a very long time. And I was like, how do we even find somebody? Right. And so, and then I looked at my notes this morning and I was like, oh my God, it was like a total God showed up moment where it was like, oh, I didn't even realize <laughs> <laughs> you didn't do AA. You got sober through refuge recovery. Well, that's not true. I, I did to, I sober through, through the A's and then did refuge recovery later on. Oh, you did. Okay. So you did both. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Well, I'm super excited to hear about your experience. Um, and typically, so as a little warm up, I like to play a little game called the lightning round, which is not fast at all. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You want to play? Okay. You, you this will be it. fun. Yeah. This will be fun. Um, do you have a favorite book that helped you early in recovery? Yeah. I mean, I, I, the book to help me in early recovery was uh, Jerry Stahl's uh, Permanent Midnight. It's about his uh, descent into drug addiction and getting out. And uh, it's actually the, the book that, that, that gave me permission to actually go write my book. Oh, wow. That's amazing. Um, what was the name of the book again? Permanent Midnight. Permanent Midnight. Oh, that yeah. really does speak to addiction, yeah, yeah, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, it's pretty bad. It was, made, it was made into a movie by Ben Stiller, and he, he played uh, Jerry Stahl. It was, it was a, it's actually a pretty good movie the movie mm -hmm. yeah. oh my goodness okay i can't wait to watch it now okay jerry saw permanent midnight gave you permission yeah you have some books we're going to be talking about your uh books you have anarchy at the circle k <laughs> i love your titles man anarchy <laughs> at the circle k gun needle spoon i wonder what that's about <laughs> <laughs> and then you have writing your way to recovery which is really important mm -hmm. um you're very prolific good for you so many books thanks um, do you have a go-to mantra or quote that you live by? Something that is important to you? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. It's a, don't be an asshole. <laughs> <Don't> be, <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's the one I want to, it's the back of my head when I want to just say, you know, cause I just think like this, want to tell people their truth. I just want to like, you know, like that, that last word. I just want to, you know, this, I just, you know, have to, have to, have to. And I'm just like, don't be an asshole. Let it go, you know. Let and it go. Oh. Yeah. And the other part of that is, do I want to be right? I want to be happy. Ooh, that's you know? a good one. Because yeah. I want both. Yeah, but I, you know, <laughs> but being right sometimes, I just don't need to tell people what they don't want to hear. I just like I want to be happy. I'm gonna let that go. <laughs> yeah, that's a. I, I feel like um, that is a real sign of maturity, man. I mm. I recently have noticed that sometimes people will say something, and I'll be like. Uh, yeah, I just don't have the energy to correct them. Right. It's just none of my business or yeah. you do you boo. <laughs> it's mm -hmm, like I don't mm -hmm. have the energy. Right. Yeah. But that's, um, that leads to emotional sobriety. I agree. Yeah. Be right or be happy. Um, you know what I also, uh, came, came up for me as, um, sometimes the decisions I make are hard, but I know that they're right. If they bring me peace. Right. Exactly. You know what I mean? Like it, it, mm -hmm. when you're confronted with somebody and you're tempted mm -hmm. to correct them or teach them a lesson or right. <laughs> enlighten them. Um, yeah. It's, it's sometimes it's better to just be quiet because I don't want any more drama. Right. I also look at things that I don't want to do. I look at why I don't want to do them and what's going on. You know, and a lot of times I just don't want to do them because it involves, you know, getting out of my comfort zone or I have to, you know, do something that that's, that that might take more energy than I want to do or, you know, you know, be be giving to somebody or not, my, you know, my, my first nature. And, and then and then I go, well, what's what's why don't you want to do this? And, you know, it usually comes down to a little bit of ego or fear. And oh, I'm just yeah. going, you know, just go do it, man. You know? Yeah. Don't you find that recovery is like doing the things you don't want to do and not doing the things you do want to do? <laughs> right, right. What, you, what I want to do is just sit at home and, and, and try and hide from everybody and isolate. And oh, recovery is like, like, get out and do something, you know, get out and, and help somebody, be a service to other people. Like, oh, come on, man, exactly. really? <laughs> I was like, COVID was actually a welcome time for me. That's what I thought. Everybody's like, it's so hard. I'm like, this is awesome. This is amazing. <laughs> I don't have to go anywhere. <laughs> we 
are a twisted lot. Right, right. So funny. Um, do you have a regular self-care or recovery routine, whether that's like a morning practice or a weekly schedule? Well, I, I recently in, 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 in COVID, I started reading and I'm not a big fan of the, of the, the language of the big book. I think it's really archaic, but in the big book of AA is page 86, 87 oh, yeah. uh, uh, on awakening. And, and, uh, uh, you know, I've heard it before or whatever, and it never really, really gelled with me. And, uh, I was taking this big test for certification and, and, mm -hmm. and this woman that was helping me, who's also in the program said, read that every morning, because I was really nervous about the whole thing. I didn't feel confident. And uh, it would it allowed me to get into a headspace, and then I meditate, and so and and that goes back to refuge too. And I meditate, and so then it would be it, the end of it says, you know, we end we end this with with a, with a period of meditation, and I would meditate there, and I start my morning life every day, and you know, it it, it I'm still doing it. I mean, it's a year and a half later, I'm still doing it, and I it, it's really a good practice because it's. I mean, I, I have a hard time having a practice uh, keeping at, but this one I've kept at it because it sets my day for me and it really yes. does. And I really sort of get that kind of like, you know, everything's okay. And, and there, there, there's a solution feeling. Oh, I love that. There is a solution. Mm -hmm. I mean, that really speaks to hope, right? Like a lot of us have to live with ongoing challenges, right? Like I was just talking exactly. to a friend who is going through a custody battle mm -hmm. and how do we maintain you know, that's probably like an unsolvable problem or a, living with a problem that's unsolved for an extended period of time, right. right? It's like, how do we maintain our peace with, you know, the challenges of life? So right. the hardest things I have to deal with is things that aren't immediately solvable oh, right. because, because I want some, I mean, I'm an addict. I want it done now. I want, I want right. to feel that now. I want everything now. And then here's, there's problems out in the world. We all have them that are like, you know, it's going to take some time to do this. It's going to, you know, you have to work at this or, or it's going to work itself out or, or time is what's going to do it. And I'm like, I don't you know, I want it now. I want it fixed, you know? So it's yeah. really hard sometimes. Yeah. I don't like uh, unresolved problems. I want to be able to like jump in, fix it, handle it, cut it out, you know, whatever. But mm -hmm. I think it's just having to live with discomfort and still being able to find peace in that discomfort. I find that there, if I, and mindful, I can recognize at least moments of peace. True. Right. Like right here, right now, everything's fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, yeah. because mostly when I'm stressed out, I'm either anxious about something that's going on in the future or ruminating about something in the past. I'm not really present. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm always looking for the patina of like, you know, looking through the, the veil of uh, uh, the fear of the past or the fear of the future, you know, or, you know, or, or the, the shame and guilt of the past and the fear oh, of the future, yeah. you know, it's always that's hard, a, you know, that's a big one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what do you have a specific way you meditate? Do you, or do you sit in silence or do you use music? Do you, use I, I, use, I use, I use both. And, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, I have a certain piece of, uh, you know, it's, um, a mix of, of stuff that I, that I put together that that's got gongs and throat mm. singing and a bunch of stuff like that. It's, it's, it's a 20 minute sit. Do I always make okay. 20 minutes? Not, you know, sometimes I make 10, sometimes I make 15 and, uh, I put in my headphones and it's, it's loud. And, the thing is, I have a really busy mind. There's a lot mm -hmm. of chatter going on there like that. I can't like listen to a, a, a Kenny G flute or, you know, that, that kind of, you know, new, new age kind of stuff because it doesn't really address it. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not the kind of guy that's going to go listen to Slayer while I, while, I, <laughs> while I meditate, you know, but I need something that, 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 that that's sort of going to uh, address that, that noise, you know, yeah. and uh, uh, this, this, this works for me. And, and, and so, you know, I, I, my, 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 uh, you know, goal is the 20 minutes, but I mean, a lot of times it's five, a lot of times it's 10, yeah. you know, and, and, and if, in the morning, the ritual I talked to you about with, with, with the, with the, with the big book pages, uh, it, it, sometimes it's just four or five, you know, just yeah. right there, you know? Yeah. I think it's important to pay attention to, and I'll allow ourselves to do what is needed and required mm -hmm. in that moment and, and not to make, um, you know, our meditation practice, another thing that we stress out about. Right, right. I'm, yeah. I'm a horrible person because I can't meditate. You know? <laughs> I'm so stressed out. I can't meditate. Yeah. <laughs> kind of defeats the whole purpose. Right. That's funny. Um, do you have one thing you wish you knew when you first got sober? Yeah. 
I, one thing I wish I knew uh, for summer was that, you know, not to take myself so seriously. Mm -hmm. I was so worried about, you know, how I read things in meetings and people I thought it was like, you know, focused on me. And it was that, you know, that, that, that just that bondage of self stuck in, you know, my own warped feeling that I was the center of the universe. And the reality was that nobody gave a damn how I read anything at a meeting and nobody really cares about what I'm doing, you know, much to my chagrin, you know, and, I, you know, it's just, it's just this obsession that, that you know, and also it was a, the, the other part about it was I always felt I was going to do something wrong. I was going to mess mistake. something up. I'm going to screw something up. And you know what? I do. I mess things up. I make mistakes, you know, and that's, that's part of the program is being able to go back and fix things and make amends and, you know, put things together. You know, I got a mouse, you know, I'll say the dumbest thing known to mankind. I still do, you know, but, I, but what I can, what, what I can do about it now is I can, I can make amends with people instead of just having some long smoldering resentment or people hating me or whatever like that. You know, people still hate me. I can't help it. <laughs> well, that's more about them. Than you. <laughs> that's so interesting. You know, I, it's a level of self-consciousness, you know, I, I, that I identified when you said that I was like, oh man, I was so self-conscious, especially when I first started going to meetings and having to read in front of a group. Wow. I was so worried about, you know, making a mistake that I couldn't comprehend what I was actually reading. Absolutely. You know, <laughs> I, I would, I would go into the meeting late sit in the back of the room, glare at everybody, wonder why they weren't talking to me, and then leave early because I didn't want to hold hands. You know? <laughs> That's so funny. Right? Isn't it funny how we're, we're like, we glare and we're like, why isn't anyone talking to me? <laughs> so I'm the newcomer. They're supposed to talk to You're me. You're supposed to be nice to me. I'll fucking kill you. i kill you. <laughs> we're funny it's funny how we sort of pick up on that vibe right right <laughs> we're like no thank you <laughs> no but yeah. i think i think a lot of us that come out of addiction uh have this uh perfectionism yeah thing it's like oh my god i can't there is i have no room for error mm -hmm. i am so damn like i don't know what that is like i'm so so damaged like I, I can't even afford to make a little mistake right you know i need i need it's like image management i need you to see me a certain way because i can't mm -hmm. bear i can't bear the consequence of making a mistake like i have right. no reserve yeah yeah That's which is rough. Just crazy yeah and it goes yeah. away pretty quickly i think you know. I, I, one, I think once you sort of look, look at the reality of it all and sort of look at it, you know, that, that, that I'm, I'm not perfect. And that, you know, that goes back to being self-absorbed. I'm not perfect, you know, yeah. and let, letting that go finally. I think it's so funny in the meetings when they read that part, like we are not saints. Yeah. Like, is anyone really confused about that? <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. Well, let me think about that. <laughs> right. But I think that when you said that um, not to take yourself so seriously and the idea of being self-conscious, I think the thing that eased my suffering a little bit was to recognize that everybody is worried about what everybody else does. Yeah. Nobody's thinking about me. We're all thinking about ourselves. Exactly. You know, also, you know, it's like, it's like, 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 just like the books I write, the, the, the life I lived is not exactly something you want to hold your head up and go, look how amazing this was. It was bad. I was not a good person. You know, and I come into the rooms and all of a sudden think I'm supposed to be the, 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 the saint, you know, like, I know like, we're not saints. You know, you know, yeah, like, I know. It's like, uh, no, you weren't, you weren't very good. <laughs> you were very good. We were just talking about you, the title of the episode should be bank robber turned recovery. <laughs> spiritual healer. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> You're like the spiritual healer now. Uh, but it's that it's those, those crazy experiences that we have that make us uniquely qualified to reach the people who have also had those same experiences. Sure. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. I, mean, I, 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 I can come into a level of, of, you know, understanding with a lot of people in early recovery because I was, I was there and, you know, and, and yeah. dealt with the, the criminal justice system and dealt with all that kind of parole and, 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 and all these things like that. And, and, and you know, it's, it's not saying that somebody that wasn't because they would deal with it, but it, there's just a certain level where there's a certain level of trust involved or yeah. somebody understands them. I remember this guy talking about how, um, there's like, he couldn't hear somebody when they were speaking down to him, like he was a piece of shit, but somebody yeah. who was vulnerable and honest and said, you know, I did that shit too. Somehow that eyeball to eyeball vulnerability in, invokes some trust. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. okay, you get, you get my kind of crazy, you know, right. you're not judging me for it, Absolutely. which is such a relief. Mm -hmm. I think when, when you're finally understood. Yeah. 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 
and connectedness too. It's mm-hmm. nice to be like, oh my God, somebody gets me. I'm connected. I'm not alone in my insanity. Right. Because I mean, we we all feel that we're like we're we're, we're unique in our in our in our you right. know dysfunction and 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 actually it's it, that one of the things that really really you know helped once I stopped glaring in the back of the room. So it really <laughs> really helped me with with, with meetings was that. Was, was you know even though people's stories were different than mine or, or you know uh, uh, they still was a level of you know people ruining their lives and and and, and yeah. I can identify with all that you know and and you know you look at people and think God they got that together they get up and share and go oh my God they don't you know <laughs> you know and it's like right. mm, okay <laughs> yeah I, I connect it you know that's something that continues to amaze me is like sometimes I walk into a room and I'm like these people are not going to relate to me. But even though our circumstances are different, the feelings are all the same. Exactly. Right. The feelings of hopelessness and shame and guilt. And, and, and then we transition to like, and things got better. Mm-hmm. I, I really feel like that um, gives people hope that they can change too. Once they identify that you understand them. Right. Right. I'm not a big uh, go to meetings uh, on while I travel thing, but I've done it a few times. Uh, and, uh, and, and it's the same thing. You walk in the room and go, oh, no, it's, this, just, this looks like Mayberry. I don't know what's going to happen here. This is weird. <laughs> and, then they're, and, and they're all like, blah, 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 blah. And they're like, oh, you get it. I get it. You know, we're, we're here universal. Also, when moving, you know, because I moved from San Francisco to L.A. but 11 years ago oh, and knew, no, knew nobody. Absolutely knew, knew, didn't know anybody. And I started going to meetings. And I had a community immediately. Yeah. And it, was, it, was just, it, was, it was amazing. How long yeah. have you been in L.A.? I've been in L.A. since 89. No, sorry. Oh. Sorry. That was weird. 2009. <laughs> I, I, li- I lived back in LA in 89 for three years back then, I did, but I was not here that whole time. Sorry. And <laughs> 2009, I moved here. 2009. Yeah. yeah. It's, yeah. it's rough to move in sobriety. I moved in sobriety oh, yeah. three years ago and I'm like, um, we, we knew some people here, actually, there was a bunch of people from San Jose moving to Idaho, mm-hmm. which was mm-hmm. kind of nice. But uh, it's been hard to like they just do it different. Out yeah, here. yeah. So it's kind of tricky. But thank God for all the Zoom meetings. Like I can still attend meetings from right. back home. Yeah, yeah. And see my people, but I try to connect here too. But it's just mm-hmm. different. Yeah, I know. Different. I came down to LA and they're all doing cakes. I don't understand. Oh my god, your cakes are big. <laughs> I'm like, what's this cake thing? <laughs> uh, we love sugar, don't we? <laughs> So funny. Um, well, let me add, let me take you back a little bit to your story. Um, I think it's so interesting to hear about people's childhoods, and because that kind of sets the stage, right? Mm-hmm. They say that alcoholism or addiction is a, you know, sign of a deeper problem. And in in my experience, it feels like the underlying issue is related to trauma mm-hmm. in most cases. You know, some people claim they don't have any trauma, but then you dig a little, you scratch the surface just barely and you're like, oh, there it is. Yep. <laughs> so um, do you want to kind of share your a few minutes on, you know, like what, what it was like growing up and what sure. led you to addiction? Yeah. Uh, I was, you know, my parents were, were two really narcissistic people and not like, you know, you know, bad way. They were just very focused on themselves. My dad was a, a professor of languages. Uh, linguistics and my mom uh, was in grad school with him and then quit to have kids and basically because my dad was a a, a Fulbright and a bunch in a, in a, in a, in a uh, you know beginning professor we moved every year we, we wow. moved all over the country we moved to Europe I lived in Iceland and the Faroe Islands and Denmark and weird places like that and then we go to different colleges like Eugene uh, Oregon Durham Carolina North Carolina and, and move around and so I was always the new kid on the block. I was always the new kid in school. In some countries, I didn't even speak the language. I looked different. I talked different. And I had a sense of alienation from the very beginning. Uh, and then on top of it all, we were sort of like left to just do what you want, kids. Go just go out and play in traffic. You know, and so it was one of those kind of things. And at one point, my family moved back to, but moved not back to, but moved to uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. And my dad got was got a uh, got a, a professorship at, at Harvard, and uh, uh, at that point, my there was a lot of uh, leading up to that. But it was weird. My parents never fought in front of us, you know, and I could never understand why they were together. And I have a picture of them uh, that that is we. It, it, but literally, my dad looks like Che Guevara, and my mom looks like Mary Tyler Moore. <laughs> and I, and they're like together. I'm like, wow, well, these people ever got together. But at, at one point, my dad just decided he didn't want to be in a family anymore, didn't want to be my mom, and he just left. And uh, at that point, uh, uh, my mom took it really, really hard. And 
you know, this one a narcissistic part comes in, she attempted suicide twice. Oof. And, uh, I would, you know, I was the kid that found her both times. She, she, uh, she slid her wrist uh, one time <gasps> and she took a lot of pills the second time when she got back out of the hospital. And, you know, it sort of hit me hard. It really hit me hard. Like it was my mom would rather not be alive than be my mom. She doesn't really love me. And there was a lot of other things going on too. Um, uh, my mom has a real problem with, 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 she's really judgmental of a lot of people. And, and there's a lot of things going on where she's, uh, uh, put down people who, ha who are overweight and, uh, I, I, I had a, like I, I developed an eating disorder as a young kid because of all this and sort of sort of that blossomed into like an addiction and that sort of what you know what my childhood went from there. And so, uh, you know, there's that was basic hardcore trauma, I, you know, and I'm, I'm not going into blame my parents for my addiction, but there was a definite level of uh, taking away the security and, and safety of being a child. And, you know, at, at about 11 or 12, I was running the streets of Boston, you know, running out and, you know, getting high and drinking and started doing drugs at that, that time in my life. And it sort of, it sort of went downhill from there. Um, what kind of, what kind of drugs did you start with? Well, it, it was, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a little older, so it was the end, tail end of the 60s, 70s. Uh, and so I started smoking pot, of course, and drinking alcohol, but then there was pills of like, uh, barbiturates and sort of weird amphetamines in those days, but they're kind of like, uh, white crosses, they were called. They're kind oh, of, I remember I those, yeah. Yeah, they were the amphetamine. And then, uh, took a lot of acid, took acid and, and mescaline and things like that. And, uh, you know, that, that's sort of what it, what it was. I, I, yeah, I did other things. I, it was the funny thing is I, I, at one point I, I did, uh, what people were calling uh, powdered THC. It was supposed to be you know, the, the, the extract from marijuana and I snorted and it got really loaded. Then years later, I realized it was heroin. You know, <laughs> so, you know, like, you know, I was like, oh, that's what that was, you know? Oh. And so, so there, there, there was, but it was really pro prolific and it was like sort of like the time when, you know, you, I couldn't, I wasn't old enough to buy alcohol, but I sure could buy drugs everywhere. That's you know, so crazy. It was, yeah, it was really crazy. That's you know? young, 10, 11 to be yeah, doing all yeah. those drugs. Yeah, 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 yeah. By 13, I was, I was doing, I was a daily user. By 13? You know? yeah. and, and your mother just didn't notice? Like she was checked she was, out? She was checked out. She was also really, she took in a ton of tranquilizers. She was like off on her own thing. She was like, you know, really obsessed with everything like that. My dad was just sort of out of my life. You did know? you not see him on like, did you not see I, him at all? Or just I see him regular? once in a while. We, you know, he we do it's like a visit or I would go somewhere with him for the weekend. You know, it was always sort of, uh, you know, it, it, but it, it was strange, you know, you know, and I love my dad dearly. He died recently a couple of years ago, but and I loved him oh. and like that. But but it, it took till me getting into recovery for us to have a really good relationship. Right. You know, yeah. too much anger and hurt. And yeah. That, you know, yeah. Too much. And, and, I, and I, I didn't I didn't know how to I didn't know how to verbalize what I felt. I didn't, I didn't know what, how to tell him what was going on. And I kept, subsequently, my dad did not either. My dad had a really hard time with emotions, you know. Yeah, and he, he was an he, academic. Yeah. And he, you know, he had a really hard time saying he loved me and things like that, you know, and, and it just sort of, it just was, uh, it was, it was, it was rough, you know. Yeah, that's a lot of trauma. Yeah. So daily user at 13, that's crazy. So I'm sure it was, was it this typical fun, fun with problems and then just problems? What, what do you mean? Oh, and that's kind of like the format that people talk about at AA meetings. You know, they oh. talk about, oh, my using was fun in the beginning, but then I started kind of getting into trouble. And then oh, yeah, yeah, the yeah, end, yeah. It was just yeah. like nothing but problems. <laughs> right. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I didn't quite catch that. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. It, it was great. I mean, I, you know, we, I use drugs because they work. Yeah, I know. I, I use, I, you know, I did drugs because I, because I, I, you know, I liked them and then, and, and uh, I didn't have to feel what I was feeling. And uh, one thing was weird, though. I smoked pot for like 15 years, and I hate pot. It just, was, just I didn't like the high. It was weird, but I, it you was available. Yeah, it was like yeah, available. Yeah. So I smoked a lot of a lot of pot. But when I, as soon as I found what I was looking for, which was heroin, I, I mm -hmm. totally jumped out. So like at, 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 I was I was a I was a kid that was totally into art. My escape was 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 drawing and and, and doing art. And I, actually, at one point, I was. Uh, youngest published cartoonist in America. I was on a- <gasps> That's amazing. I was, I was in a magazine called Kids Magazine. It was, it was, it was produced by Junior Scholastics. It was sort of this sort oh, of yeah. art magazine for kids. And, uh, uh, and so uh, at, at age 17, I, I got a scholarship to go to the San Francisco Art Institute and, and went in there. I was probably one of the youngest people in there and started doing, uh, my drawing started moving. And, and so I started getting into animation. I got a film degree, but while I was San Francisco, I just two things happened. One was punk rock and the other one was heroin. Mm -hmm. And so at 17, 18, I was, I was uh, on my way to full on addiction pretty much. 
Wow. Yeah, you kind of have that Billy Idol look going. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you've heard that before. <laughs> a little bit. Person. Much younger, much younger Billy Idol. Um, yeah, people have to watch the YouTube for that. <laughs> there you go. There you go. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, I know you have some colorful stories. You did some bank robbing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I, what I'm really interested in, though, is at what point did you sort of recognize, like, I can't do this anymore. I need to get help. Well, you know, I, if I talk about this a lot when, when I work because I work, work in treatment part time. Is, is that there's a, always this level of, of I kind of want to get clean. I just don't know how, but I don't know what that really looks like. Mm -hmm. And then also, I don't know what my life looks like without getting loaded. So there's, there's sort of gray area there. And like I talked about heroin, I was on, I was a heroin addict for, for 18 years. That's and for like, you know, I will say, I will say this for five, six years, it was great. It was amazing. You know, I was like, like it was, you know, not that every day was amazing. I'll, I'll, I'll pull that back. There was probably some. Bad I mean, regular life isn't amazing. Yeah, right, right, exactly, <laughs> exactly. But you know, the other thirteen years were were bad. You know, mm -hmm. it was really, really a rough life, and I, I put myself through a lot. You know, and uh, 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 but but I, I I kept doing that thing where you know at least I'm not dead. You know, like like making these like you know like like you know that ah, wasn't so bad. You know, you you know like this kind of thing like that. And it wasn't really till I got arrested. Uh, because I, I didn't have I didn't have an extensive criminal record of being arrested. I had an extensive criminal record of being a criminal, and uh, uh, I I was arrested uh, for uh, you know armed robbery, uh, bank robbery, and uh, it, it 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 sort of the consequences of my life sort of really sort of really happened. And you know I, I found myself in jail, and then I found myself in court, and the judge is talking to me about looking at uh, giving me three strikes uh, to twenty five to life. And that was a real eye opener. But then, you know, I got high in jail and I sort of, you know, all this thing like that. But I think the real, the real point in my life, what happened was I, you know, I'll cut to the chase. I finally went to prison and uh, I was on the exercise yard uh, uh, at San Quentin. And I looked at it at all this stuff. I was 41 years old and I looked at all these people there and what was going on. And the, it was gray and overclouded. And I literally did, you know, how did I get here? You know, and it's not like, how did I get here? You know, what happened? It was like, I knew what got me there, but how did my whole life get here? You know, and then what it really came down to is, you know, here I was 17 year old kid going to art school and interested in art and beauty and doing things and music and all that stuff like that. And now, you know, some 23 years later, I'm, I'm you know, jaded, I'm in prison. My life looks like, you know, like, like there's nothing good going on in my life. And at that point, I'm like, I'm like, this is not, this is, I'm not gonna, I'm not coming back here. I'm not doing this again. You know, and and that that was that was that was the biggest wake up I I, I had ever. Like it was, you know. And did I run a perfect program and did I stay sober? No, of course I screwed up because I'm an addict. But that was a big aha moment. It's a big wake up, you know. Realize what's going on, kind of thing. Because uh, uh, there's there's nothing good happening in prison. It's it's literally just endless amounts of boredom punctuated by intense violence, and uh. I just, I, I couldn't, there was just, you know, I, there was, I, I couldn't do my music there. I couldn't you know, do anything. I, all I could do was, was be a writer there and, and sort of where I started writing. But it was- started it, writing in prison? Yeah, yeah. But I mean, it was like, it was like, you know, like, like there's, there's, there's nothing good. You know, in my mind's like, obviously there's nothing good going on here. You know, you need to, you need to step up. You need to really get your life together. And that, that's, what, that's what really happened. Yeah, it sounds like a, a moment of clarity. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Like that existential, like, how did I get here? Right. Absolutely. Like I, I've heard that many times people are like, it's, and it's a mystery. It's like, how did this even happen? It's mm -hmm. like, I was kind of curious how you were able to, you know, get a scholarship at 17, even though you started doing heroin and things at, at 13 and manage a life for so long. I, 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 I just, I, 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 don't, I, I can't, I can't tell you. I got, I got the scholarship to my father uh help me out get that my father really wanted me to go to college and i didn't really want to and i was sort of pissing off my life and he was like you got to do make something in your life so he really pushed me to do that and I, so through my father i got the scholarship and you know i was actually a you know, this sounds really egotistical i was actually a talented artist and i sort of would have probably gone somewhere if i hadn't gotten way laid by by drugs drugs and alcohol yeah. you know and uh but my 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 whole focus then turned into music at that point and i started i started playing in bands and and then eventually 
managing bands and road managing and going on tour with bands where I did like major punk bands in San Francisco at the time. Oh, so, yeah. So I would imagine the drug culture is pretty integrated with the music scene. So. Oh, absolutely. It was like, you know, you sort of, at uh, that time, you sort of you know, kind of re required to. <laughs> required. You know? Heroin required. <laughs> yeah, yeah, required. We must be, must they drug be test you. You have to be on drugs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're clean. Get out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I remember going to a job interview and she's like, oh, we do drug testing. I'm all for what? Yeah, right. <laughs> what? what? Yeah. I didn't get hired. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and the other yeah. these, these days it's like, yes, yes, go ahead. It's awesome. <laughs> yes. I can't discriminate now. It's so funny. Okay, so let's fast forward a little bit. So mm -hmm. you get out of San Quentin. How maybe describe to me a little bit about how the the sobriety and recovery journey started to unfold for you. Cause I'm really curious as to when the well, it, 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 I was, it, I was, like I said, I was getting loaded in, 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 in jail, in, in, in jail and my lawyer in jail, actually, my lawyer came up to me and said, what are you doing? You know, <laughs> he said, it, my lawyer didn't even like me. He was like, he's like, dude, dude you know, you, you, if you get busted for using in here I mean, and they're, you're looking up three strikes, there's nothing I can do for you. You know, so, so th there was a, there was a prison drug program uh, that I could, that I could, that I could get, that I could get into. And so he said, go over there, stop using, and, you know, I'm, I'm going to do the best I could for you. And at this time, literally, they were, they were saying, you know, three strikes to 25 life. That, that's what <laughs> I was looking at. And so I went to this drug program, and it was like, you know, like, it was like a, a attack therapy kind of drug program in prison. And uh, I mean, it, sorry, in county jail. And, uh, they, you know, they yelled at you. And then, and that night they would go away and it would just be jail, you know? So it was just, it was sort of weird, but I stayed, I stayed, I, I stayed clean in there for, for a while. I did a little bit later on, but I, I, I pretty much stayed clean in there. And then when I, I was clean, when I left to go to San Quentin and I tell you the truth, I, I knew enough not to be involved with drugs. Cause you know, basically what, what, how I really survived San Quentin was, was like, you know, not being involved in the mix. If, if, you're, if, if you're not buying drugs from people, you're not having sex with people, you're not, you know, in gambling or, or contraband, all this kind of things like that, they got no use for you. You know, you're, you're, you're not giving them any income. You're not doing anything. You're not involved. And people just sort of kind of leave you alone. Oh, they do. And, yeah, okay. you know, I mean, for a couple of, you know, I, I got sweated from my commissary and stuff like that a couple of times and I had to fight back and blah, 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 all that kind of, you know, new fish crap. But it, it, if, if, if I didn't, if I wasn't giving them anything, if I wasn't, you know, I don't want to, I wasn't joining up a gang. I wasn't the guy that was going to, you know, you know, be violent. I just was like, you know, I'm not part of the mix. It, it's, it's what, it's what got me through there. You know, so yeah. it, so that, that, that's, that's where, that's, that's where I started my recovery. You know, okay. and when I, when I got out of prison, I, I actually went to rehab. Okay. You from know? prison to like a 30 day rehab? No, to like a long-term uh, behavior modification, 18 months rehab. Oh my goodness. And it's a kind of place. I really should... feel like that's really the, like the 30 days isn't yeah. really even in enough oh, no. time for the no. fog to lift. Yeah. Yeah. I did. Right. I did. I did two rehabs back to back 18 months each. Each. Okay. I was, I was in, I was in rehab for like three with a re, with a relapse in between, but I was, I was in re rehab for like almost three years. Yeah. That's, I, I, I mean, it takes a long time for like your brain to oh, sort of heal from all absolutely. that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah and to sort of develop new skills mm -hmm. and get emotionally stable and work through some of the trauma that triggers people to relapse. And yeah, it's, it takes, it does take some time. I, I feel like our rehab system is kind of broken. I mean, because oh. of 30 days, what does that do? It's, it's, it's being dictated by the insurance companies because they think 30 days is like a viable amount of, of time. And it's just, it's just ridiculous. You know? yeah, yeah. It really is. It's, it doesn't really work that well. I'm interested. Well, I'm like, remind me to, if I forget to ask you, I'm curious about the kind of treatment um, that you participate in. Okay. I know you do drug and alcohol counseling. Yeah. I want to hear about yeah. that. Okay. So um, to so attack therapy, isn't that's when they yell at you and stuff. And yeah, they, they, they shave your head. They, like they a, yell at you. They, 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 they tell you you're a piece of shit. You're a scumbag. And you know, I already knew that, you know, they, they, they break you down and then they sort of build you back up, you know? Okay. So it was, it was, it was, it was, for me, it was really great because I was a really angry person. I didn't think I was an angry person. I was very angry that the world didn't know how amazing I was. I was the <laughs> kind of guy that, that, you know, sat in the recording studio and did a lot of drugs and wondered why nobody came and listened to my music. But I never played out loud, never did any music. So, you know, but I, so, you know, it was like really angry that, that I wasn't more famous or, or even slightly famous. And, you know, this just doesn't make any sense, but it's typical addict, addict stuff. Yeah. 
And th that first program really, really, you know, got into my anger management, got into my, you know, my self-centeredness, my kind of behavior. And so it, it, it wasn't like a, a, a wasted time when I relapsed and, and, and went, you know, went out again for a few months. It was sort of, I really kind of got a basis of it. And then the next program was a, a, was a 12 step based program. Okay. And, so you did, was, did you go to AA or NA or? I, I went to AA first and then I moved on to NA. And uh, uh, it, it was, it was like, you know, real, real bottom of the line program. It was Salvation Army program. I went yeah. there and it was, it was rough. It was like men's, but it was, but you know, that that's what I had left. That's literally what I had left. You know, there's no other program out there, you know, and, the, and they took me in and just, you know, allowed me to do what I had to do. And it was important. You know? Yeah. I've actually spoken at Salvation Army meetings mm -hmm. and that's one of those experiences I was t talking about earlier when I walk into a room and I'm like, oh, these people aren't going to relate to me. Right, right. Right. But then we start sharing stories about like what it felt like to experience different, you know, specific kinds of pain. Yeah. You know, like the self-sabotaging. How did I, do, how did I get here again? Why did I do that? I didn't want to use, or I didn't want to do what I did. Yeah. And how bad the guilt and shame, like everybody relates to that. Right, I, mean, right. I found that when you speak the language of the heart, it like crosses all socioeconomic kind of boundaries. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know? yeah. So I was a horrible client though. I was, I was still trying to be, I was trying to be my, who I was without using. So I was cheating and I was like lying and I was having sex with the women in the program. And I was like, you know, doing all this. <laughs> oh, stuff. I was, you're you know, one of those. <laughs> just, just, just a scumbag, you know, and I was actually, I wasn't even going to meetings. I was, I was, I was signing my own sheet with different, you know, sign up sheet Pens, with different, yeah. colored, different colored pans. Like nobody yeah. ever done it before. And I, and I got caught and, and they said, you know, and I was still on parole and they said, we're going to kick you out, which would meant I would get violated and go back to prison. And, and, oh uh, my God. and I said, I'll do anything you want. And they said, well, go to meetings and get a sponsor and do the right thing. I was like, what? That's crazy. And uh, I did. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. I, I did, you know, and I, and I made a, I made a deal with myself. I said, if, if my life's not better in a year, I'm, I'm going to start using it again. You know, screw oh. this. And, and God damn it, my life was better in a year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so funny when they finally, it's like they tell you that diet and exercise is good for you. And right. when, you finally, <laughs> when you finally submit to it, you're like, oh, this is amazing. <laughs> Shit actually works. <laughs> Why did they tell me that earlier? <laughs> Why did they tell me that? <laughs> yeah, there's no teacher like experience, though. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I need yeah. I needed to have the experience of sobriety. To, that's like trying to explain an orgasm to someone who's never had one. Right, right, exactly, <laughs> exactly. I have it to know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Spiritual experience. Right, right. <laughs> so funny. Okay, so you, okay, so you were, so you started going to the meet. Did you get a sponsor right away and do the twelve steps I, and do I all did. the homework? I did. I got a sponsor that was like was like you know who who smoked a little too much pot and drank a little too much beer. I thought he was a total wussy, and you know. <laughs> And and he was just so gracious and nice and wonderful and walked me through the steps. Mm. And uh, I, I haven't seen him a few years, but I still live in San Francisco. I'd seen him once in a while. And uh, he was one of the people that said, you know, you don't, don't, you have a problem identifying as an alcoholic. Maybe you should go try NA. And I said, okay, I'll give it a go. And went there for a while and and, and then got another sponsor. And, and I just, you know, got involved with the program. And I just, I just did it, you know, and, you know, was able to look, you know, the, I didn't have like a burning bush aha moment, but the steps really like showed that I just lived in a lot of fear. You know, yeah. I put up this big bravado, this front, this badass guy, oh, I went to prison, blah, 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 which is a bunch of bullshit, you know, but the thing was, I was, I was just a scared kid. I was that scared kid when mom killed herself, you know, I was like, you know, not to kill herself, but attempt to kill herself, mm -hmm. you know, and all those things. And I, and I just had to look at that. And that was just so eye opening, you know. You know, and you know, and people go, "Why do you use?" Like, oh, I love to use. You know, no, it's I, I love to not feel those feelings. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want to feel what I feel. You know, it just, it was just, it was so, it was so amazing. You know, and it wasn't like I got it, like, ooh, this is amazing. But it was like I was able to like look at things in a different way, and and, and you know, be, be less judgment, and then go back to my mantra: "Don't be an asshole." Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> that's sort of what yeah, happened. You know, it really happened, and it made it, 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 it just essentially made my life a lot better. Yeah. I found that, um, it was, it's the little shifts that change yep. the entire trajectory. Right? Absolutely. It's, it's not always like this lightning bolt of like, Oh my God, like you're suddenly awake. Right. This is like sudden jolting revelations that you're, you know, it's the little, it's the little revelations. It's mm -hmm. the baby steps. And it seems like a, a gentler way to sort of wake up right. slowly, gently. Right. 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 We come to, we come to these realize we like come to these realizations and, 
and start eliminating like these negative beliefs. Like we start really looking, examining mm-hmm. our thinking. It's like, is this really true? And right. man, the, how did you feel about the four step? That was one of my most profound experiences. Yeah, I, 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 I didn't, it didn't, you know, blow my mind. It, I was, you know, and I was really, really ther- thorough, uh, but it, it was uh, the fifth step telling somebody all that stuff. That, that was, that was, you know, it, it was weird because I was writing a bunch of stuff already. I was writing a lot of memoir. We were writing like that. already. Yeah. yeah so I, I was already writing prolific, not prolific, you know, I was writing a lot. You were. I don't, no, know, how, I, I don't know how prolific that was. You are a prolific writer, <laughs> my book. I, I was writing a lot. And so it was, it was kind of an extension of that. Yeah. And, I, and, I, and, I, and I, you know, huge. I read a big, you know, uh, one of those one of those tablets everybody writes in, you know, I, I, I filled the whole thing up and then, and then I turned around with the, on the back pages on the back wow. of it, you know, and, and so it was, it was full, and I, you know, and I was so pissed off at everything that I, that I was like, you know, the fourth step is like, you know, resentments. And I was like, you know, woman behind me in the grocery store, <laughs> like that, you, know? <laughs> you know, like, you know, what? who cares? Everybody. You know, you know I, I was, I was, I was up in my room in the rehab and then people across the street smoking and laughing. I was like, people across the street smoking and laughing. Mm. And, you know, like, I hate them, you know, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. But, you know, and then, I, but then I, that's when I read it all. And then, and then that last, you know, what, what's my part in this column was like, oh my mm. God. And my, my sponsor was so kind and he just said, you know, look at this stuff and just figure this out. And uh, that that's what really, really, really kind of like that. That was the eye opener, you know. And, and yeah, I, the my I, part. I, yeah. And I just yeah. don't want to make decisions out of fear anymore. Yeah. That, that's a crazy place to be. It's not a it's not a healthy place. So that's what you saw in the four step is in your part was that you were making decisions based off of fear. Basically, most of them. Yeah. Yeah. You know. And, and it wasn't the fear of, you know, the fear of looking bad, the fear, fear of people thinking about me, the fear of, you know, not getting what I thought I deserved. And all these really self-centered, weird, you know, back to what we talked about originally, uh, obsession that people are all, you know, obsessed about me. And that, you know, that people like me don't care. We don't care what you're doing, you know. And uh, uh, it, it just really was like, you know, the, the obsession of stuff. You guys got to let that go, you know. It's just crazy. Yeah. And, you know, that, that, that's basically what, what I've been doing for like the last, you know, 22 years of just letting it go. And, mm-hmm. and it's, it's so much, it's so freeing. So you know? freeing. Yeah. I, you know, I, there's just that, that you know, I, and, and you know, like, you know, we joked about it earlier, you know, we were talking about that, you know, there are people that don't like me. I, I can't have everybody that will love me. That's not, that's not, you know, a reality check, you know? Yeah. And so if someone doesn't like me, I, I don't have to do, you know, it's that weird thing. You're, you're, you're in a room and, and 60 people, you know, there's six people in the room and 59 of them say, you're, you're awesome. And that one person goes, you're an idiot. And you go, oh, that guy knows what he's talking about. You know, and you want to, you want to win that person's opinion back and you want, you want them to care about you. You don't care about the other 59 people that said you're amazing and love you. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever. You'll just feel whatever. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. just so insane, you know? It really is. I mean, it's so easy though. I think everybody does it, right? We yeah. all, yeah, we, and I, and I love that book. Um, I think it was Pablo Coelho, The uh, Four Agreements. Is that who wrote that? I don't know. I never oh, Pablo Coelho wrote The uh, uh, the Alchemist. I don't forget uh-huh. who wrote um, The Four Agreements, but one was mm-hmm. don't take anything personally. In yeah. the idea. And yeah. I remember... I remember somebody saying, oh, it's none of your business what people think about you. And I was mm-hmm. like, what are you, you're insane. Well, that- <laughs> They're talking about me. So it's my business. <laughs> but then I learned that it's not my business because people are just mirrors. You mm-hmm. can't love or hate something about somebody else unless yeah. it's something you love or hate about yourself. So when they're looking at me, they're just seeing a reflection of the things yeah. that they either love or don't love about themselves. So it really Absolutely. has nothing to do with me. Yep. Right. And, and so this idea of not taking anything personally is super freeing. Mm-hmm. Um, Deepak Chopra sort of set this gauntlet down for me, not mm-hmm. so self-centered, but it was like, if you can use this concept, you can mm-hmm. use it for, as a, for a tool for evolution. And it's, and I kind of broke it down into like, if you spot it, you got it. Exactly. So like yep. when I was doing inventories and I would, recognize something I was resentful at somebody about mm-hmm. something and when I got down to the principle of why I didn't like them like somebody was being condescending to me I recognize that I can be condescending to yeah. other people and I hate that about myself mm-hmm. right and the goal of the spot it you got it is to practice self-compassion mm-hmm. and self-empathy yeah Um, because we can't live with exiled parts of ourselves mm-hmm. otherwise we live in denial so 
I thought that was a really, I, I think that was one of the tools that really helped me to evolve is when I recognized I was mad at somebody for something to recognize what was the principle and then recover. I had a sponsor say, can you love your unlovable parts? Ooh. I was like, is that heavy? <laughs> I know. I was like, sometimes the answer is no, but um, to have ultimate love and compassion for yeah. recovery is about recovering your whole self, the good and the bad. Right, right. There, there was an early recovery. There was this woman at, at this meeting I would go to. She sat in the front row, which I didn't do. And she was really <laughs> involved, but she shared every meeting. And she talked about what was going on in her life. And I just, I was just so angry at her for sharing every meeting and talking about her stuff, blah, blah, blah. And years later, I realized like, like she's actually using the meeting where I was just a, 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 a Vaurier. I was just there to like, see what's going on. Right. And I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't secure enough mm -hmm. in my life or worried about what other people thought about that actually talk about what was happening to me. And all this stuff was happening to me. I was a ball of nerves and freaked out and scared and all this stuff like that because I didn't know how to live my life without drugs and alcohol. And there's this woman up there actually using a meeting for what it's for. And I was mad at her. <laughs> I mean, isn't it funny? You gosh, she's, I, I, I know those people too who always raise their hand. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh God, you got that whole look at me thing going on. And then yeah, I look right. at myself and I'm like, eh, that's me. <laughs> God damn it. Not bad. <laughs> uh, let's love her. <laughs> right. Yeah. She's all, look at me, look at me. And I'm like, oh, and I'm just mad because she's taking attention away from me. <laughs> right. Isn't exactly. that embarrassing? Exactly. It's like that awkward moment where you realize you're the asshole. Yep. Oops. Hate that. Hate that. <laughs> Hate that. Um, Okay. So we talk a lot about like 12 step programs. What was mm -hmm. refuge recovery? Like, how did, why were you attracted to that? Well, I, I got into meditation. I actually got into a, to a, an NA group in San Francisco that, that had a Dharma talk and wasn't really oh, about yeah. NA. And then there was a, a 20 minute sit and uh, it met every Tuesday night. And I was there for like five years. And wow. at, at that time, uh, the thing started coming out called uh, Dharma punk. Uh -huh. And it, it was uh, Noel Levine and his his people uh, started like a meditation meeting that, that was, and I started going to that too. Uh, and uh, it, I guess that sort of evolved into a, a, a refuge and and whatever else mm -hmm. happened there. And so I just started going, I, I started going to meetings that had meditation in them. Mm -hmm. And and that's that's how I, I, I sort of blossomed off into refuge for, 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 for a hot minute. I mean, it was there for a little, a, 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 until I, well, until I moved down here. Because then, okay. then I, I couldn't really find them. And then, then at the time, uh, there was a refugee recovery meeting on the west side. And if you know L.A., I live on the east side. You never oh. go to the west side ever because it's an hour and a half in traffic. You know, oh, you know. At, at that time, it, it hadn't moved over. There was one flying the east side and sort of lost track of them. But it, but it, it, what, what really attracted me to it was, was and, and, and uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not, you uh, 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 a, a, a practicing Buddhist, I have a lot of uh, a, a, a attraction to, to, to Buddhism, and they really use a lot of, a lot of Buddhist concepts. I mean, so, yeah. so does the 12 steps. 12 steps has a, a few Buddhist concepts in there, too, uh, just sort of mixed in with a bunch of other stuff. And, and, and th th this, this was like really sort of using those Buddhist concepts, uh, uh, being of service and about other things and, and meditation to, 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 to bolster your recovery. And that's what really attracted them to me. I, I was reading a lot of Buddhist literature and a lot, a lot of uh, sort of th things in that nature at, at that time. And, and so that, that's what that's what really you know get. And also, I, I for for me, I meditate better in a room full of people than I yeah. do at home by myself. And there's an energy there. An energy, helps me, yeah. You know, and 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 I can sit for 20 minutes, sit in a room full of people with no problem. Mm -hmm. You know, at, at home it's like blah 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 blah. You know, like you know. Isn't get up, amazing? do something. There's a cat over there. Look, shiny object. Do this, do that. You know, <laughs> and so it it it, it really helped, and, and it really it really helped my uh, my meditation practice, and, and and I really needed that because I I I didn't I really didn't know how to meditate when I coming in. Uh, it, it was sort of like this ethereal, cool thing to do that that yeah. maybe was good for you, and I'd sit there and just think about shit. <laughs> and, right. and, and and this, and, you know, in getting myself involved with meditation groups really helped me. And that and it, 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 it felt it felt good to be part of too. Like just like AA. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think the the thing, the community aspect of the twelve step programs, or and even refuge recovery. You know, they talk about service and meditation and just being connected right? It's, it's uh, so easy to isolate when you're, you know, in addiction. 
that, um, you know, they say that the opposite of addiction is connection. And That's so, what they say. Yeah. 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 And I really, what I liked about the 12 step programs and still appreciate, it's sort of like a ready-made community. It's like, yeah. I need to be able to give, to pass it along, mm-hmm. right? Like that helps me to stay sober is working yeah. with newcomers. Right. Um, I need to be reminded of the same things over and over again, because mm-hmm. I'm quick forget, forgetter mm-hmm. like we do. Mm-hmm. Um, so I really appreciate that. I'm curious about your concept. I want to ask you about your, your current work, but before I switch to that, maybe mm-hmm. you can tell me a little bit about your concept of a higher power, whether it is of how it evolved. I'm sure it's evolved over the years, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I, 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 I'm, you know, my mom and uh, well, my mom was a, 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 what do you call it? A Roman Catholic. And my dad was a Marxist. So there was some very problems going on at home. Uh, it was pretty difficult. And, but I, there was there was a little tiny bit where we went to church and stuff like that. It was I really didn't dig it, and I had a real problem with you know uh, uh, the the guilt of God in that in that aspect of, of the Catholic Church. Uh, and not not that I'm you know if that people are into that, that's fine. I I, I don't judge people or anything like that because I feel they're probably better off if they have something they believe in. Right. And I came in and and really had a really, really this you know, like my first sponsor. I'm talking about how generous he was. He, I was mm-hmm. like arguing with him, and we went to the first first one two three, and he's like you know. Okay, okay, let's agree to disagree. Like, blah, 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 you know, <laughs> and I'm just a, such a nice man. And uh, and I really didn't have a concept of it at all, you know. And I, people say, go look at the ocean, it's bigger than you. I'm like, okay, fine, there's something bigger than me. <laughs> and really, what what what, what, what evolved to me on my higher power was was that, that I didn't want a vengeful higher power, I didn't want a power that judged me, I didn't want a power that was sort of there, uh, you know, a, a serial or whatever. It wasn't gonna be the doorknob, it wasn't gonna be the group, it wasn't gonna be all these things. And what 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 my, my what happened was was and through Buddhism uh, was that I came to a realization that I had been living myself uh, been living my life was hard because I'd been living against the grain and going against the the rhythm mm-hmm. of the universe mm-hmm. and 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 I I'd, I'd been doing everything to not, not just not be in flow with the rest of the people around me and that really gave me an idea that that was that, that the universe being in rhythm of the universe was actually was actually my higher power. You know that oh, that, like that, that. That, that, that that you know that that, that it, it, there's this all-encompassing huge thing around me that I that I can't explain, and I, I you know that that I don't need to explain it, and I don't really need to explain what my higher power is. I just need to know it's there. I need to know it it, it cares about me and, and has my best interest. And and so I feel feel that if I'm in rhythm with the universe, then I'm I am one of the whole, and that's where the Buddhism comes in. And so it, you know it, it's it's just I got to stay in that place. I got to stay in that place, and that's really you know being of service, caring about others, not being self-centered and all those, those things we, we've been talking about all night, you know? So that, you know, that's, that's, that's the, uh, that, that's, that's the long version of my definition there. No, that's, it's important to sort of like, you know, I appreciate your thought process because it is confusing for a lot of people. And I, you know, I've been sober a long time. It confuses me sometimes. Mm-hmm. And, and I think for me, it's like, it ended up being like, well, the universe is law and it's personal. Like I appreciate, I appreciate science and like the laws of the universe, like, you know, gravity, attraction, karma. Like I was, I was aware that there are all the, you know, laws of the universe, but uh, I also needed to feel like something cared about me personally. Absolutely. Yeah. So, and I, you know, the need to explain or define kind of has left me. Mm Mm-hmm it's more of a practice thing, practicing yep. prayer, meditation, being of service and connecting with others. Is kinda, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I love the little serendipity moments, like when cool things happen yeah. that's that are unexplainable. Exactly. Um, tell me a little bit about the work you do. I know you're, you, you know, you've dedicated your life to helping others, you know? Yeah. Relieve. Yeah. I've been working in treatment since my Oh, I, I don't know, for, for over for like 17 years or 19 years or so, I think about 19 years. And uh, so I, but up recently, I recently went and got certified. That was the big test I took took this year. Uh, and I know the reason I sort of got out of it, but, but, but I, you know, I was a, I'm a drug and alcohol counselor and, you know, I've worked, I worked in basic 12 step programs where you come in and do, you do the one, two, three, you know, in 90 days, you do the three steps and it's sort of get pushed out and stuff like that. And then the other programs I worked at were long-term programs and you, you, you got a sponsor, you went to meetings and you know, this whole thing with sign-up sheets. And the recently the, the place that I'm at now in, 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 in it's, it's called Cast Centers and it's in, in West Hollywood, uh, Beverly Hills. It, 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 it's, it's centered towards meeting the client where they're at. 
And so there, I, I can, I talk to people about what works for me. And then when I talk to them about what works for them and a lot of people come in resistant to AA, resistant to 12 steps, resistant to a lot of other organized things. And, and, you know, I, I piecemeal put together a, a program for them. You know, and the thing is that what I tell them is you know, A is not the only answer in town, you know, it's an answer for a lot of other people, you know, it's an answer for me and, and, but but if, if if you don't want to go there, then you have to incorporate these things in your life. You have to find a community. You have to find a spiritual practice. You have to find therapy. You know, you have to find all these things, and so that, that I help that people incorporate that in their lives. It's a lot more work. You know, it we is, we, yeah. we go one stop shopping. We go down there and bam, it's right there, and it's all put together. But there's some people who are so so you know so adamantly against it, and 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 that's fine. And and you know, I've seen a lot of people get turned away from a that hate it and don't like the don't like the the what they see as God and a bunch other things like that that's a problem and then they don't get recovery right. and so so for me I, it, you know I, I literally you know find somebody a therapist or help them find a therapist and then like you know get somebody involved in a sangha where they can go meditate and then have some kind of activity they're involved with like people i know people that that, that you know that, that, that could go and just meet up things and they go hiking with people whatever find like-minded people that they're, they're, and find sober ones or whatever that they're going to help them and then the other part is just, you know, being a service, go get a volunteer job, I'm um, not job, but go get a volunteer position, go do something. So all those kind of elements, you put them together, it's sort of like a, you know, like a mini AA without being the AA, you know, and, and that, that, that's sort of what I do with a lot of people. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, management, uh, case management of what they do and things like that. And, and you know, it, 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 it's, 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 it works. It works for it if you do it, you know. And then I have people who are in AA, and I have people in refuge, and I have people in smart, and I have people all these yeah. things like that. And I allow people to do what they want to do, and uh, you know the success rate is 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 larger, you know, because right. I'm not sitting there saying you have to do this, you know. Right. Now, now if somebody comes in that they they go into smart recovery, they keep relapsing and relapsing and relapsing. I'm gonna go, hey, let's try and do something different, right? You know, and and let, you know, let's put this program together like I just talked about, or once you go to A and see what's happening there. You know, so so I, you know, I'm willing to work with somebody to the point that you know I'm not going to watch them kill themselves. Right. But it, but it, but it, it's always open to interpretation, and and it's always being the client at their level. And I think yeah, that, I think it, that is so important. Everybody is coming with a different. I think that's why recovery is so hard, is because everybody's coming with sort of a different set of beliefs, yeah. and you really do have to. I think that's brilliant. You meet them where they're at. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I, and I, I just, I just, I'm just tired of seeing people go out, you know, it's, it's, it's rough. Yeah. And believe me, I still see people go out and, and, I, and, it, you know, I think the drugs are stronger and harder these Oof, days, you know, scary. I mean, I got kids coming in doing fentanyl and it just blows yeah. my mind and, you know, they're young and they're already burned out at, you know, 21, you know, 19, 21, that they're, they're, they've seen a lot in their, their, you know, half the people they know are dead from fentanyl and things like that. And that, that was me after 18 years of using, that wasn't me after two or three years of using him when I was a kid, yeah. you know, yeah. and, and then, and then the, the mess harder, much more prevalent cokes everywhere. And then everything's got fentanyl in it. And on top of it all, it's just crazy. You know, yeah, it's, it's a really, really weird time. Yeah. Yeah. My and, nephew has had four uh, people, four friends. I mean, he's like I, a clean cut, went to yeah. college, yeah. works in corporate, good Mm -hmm. He's a, he's a good kid. I mean, 27, he's not a kid, but you know, <laughs> I'm old. Um, but yeah, he's lost, he's lost four friends to accidental yeah. fentanyl overdose. Yeah. Fentanyl, yeah. So it's like doing drugs. It's like Russian roulette now. Right. Right. Well, and you know, it's, it, it's fake Vicodans, people getting pills in that used to, pills used to be like a kind of safe area to go to. Like, you're yeah. not going to overdose on these things. Are you going to be okay? And now the the, the fake Vicodans got, yeah, it just blows blow my mind. And then down here, like, you know, I, I it, marijuana is legal it just it just it's prevalent society of using you know it's 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 hard there, there's times i used to live downtown la and there, there's times where you know i would come on i would come on my, my my loft and i'd walk out of the neighborhood and people are shooting up in front of me and smoking <laughs> and using and drinking and all this like that and i literally feel like i was the only person in la not getting loaded <laughs> you know you were, huh? yeah, pretty my neighbor pretty much it, yeah. it just it's it, it, it's just so prevalent you know and yeah. i just couldn't imagine being a kid coming up in that right now because you know it, it's just so wrapped up in everything yeah it's, it's just super what it scary is. Yeah. yeah it's important it, this these messages of recovery are so important more important now than mm -hmm. ever before absolutely the stakes are so high yeah 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 you don't i don't think we're gonna see people with 18 year careers of fentanyl use no you know, you, you, I mean, you can do that. And I used to think heroin was so bad and it, mm -hmm. I mean, it really is. Right. Yeah. But like yeah. you said, I mean, I've known people who are on heroin for decades. Yep. 
yeah. right? And and then eventually get clean and stuff. But um, fentanyl, you don't see long. I mean, all of our, you know, Prince, Tom Petty, mm-hmm. Michael mm-hmm. Jackson. I mean, those yeah. are just the people that we know about that died from fentanyl. Exactly, use. exactly. There's not a lot of long-term fentanyl users. No, it's it's just it's just too unpredictable. And then on top of you have just like everything else, you have chemists who aren't really chemists or making it somewhere. And the, the, the strength is, is, there's no level of, you don't know what you're getting. You have no idea what you're getting. And, and that, there's, the margin of error there is so slim, whereas heroin, it was much greater, greater you know? Yeah. Yeah, so no, I don't know. I, I'm glad I'm not out there doing it. Doesn't, know, it doesn't so look attractive hot. anymore. No, it does not. Oh my goodness. Well, Patrick, I'm so grateful for our time together. Um, I want to encourage everybody to uh, connect with you. Um, read your books, Anarchy at the Circle K. That's your latest. Yep. Are you doing? You're doing a reading coming up pretty soon. I'm doing doing a reading on the 23rd of October at Wacko Soap Soap uh, a Factory in. Uh, Soap plant, uh, sorry, soap plant uh, in uh, in Los Angeles. Uh, it's on Hollywood Boulevard in uh, Los Feliz. Look it up. Come Hollywood on down. Boulevard. 4 p.m. October 23rd, Sunday. 4 p.m. Sunday, October 23rd. I'm going to link it in the show notes. Um, awesome. Yeah, I mean, I wish I would fly out. <laughs> That'd be great. I mean, we have so many mutual friends now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh my goodness, the whole yeah. book. Yeah, so I'm going to be publishing a book called The 12-Step Exploration Guide, um, cool. How to Navigate the 12 Steps for the Sober Curious. Uh huh. So I've, I, over the years, I've heard of all like the the barriers to entry. Like, Mm -hmm. I don't like the label of alcoholic. I, you know, don't identify with God. I, you know, just all the typical things that you hear over the years. And I'm Mm -hmm. like, you know what, what made me different than someone else? And it was Mm -hmm. context and perspective. So that's, that's, that's what I'm writing about. So maybe I'll come out when it gets published, I'll have to come out to your neck of the woods. Absolutely. That'd be great. And yeah Anna and Wendy Adams and all those people right right you, it, I can, actually my clients could use your book so yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's the hope right yeah yeah very cool well listen thank you so much for your time um I send me all the links to all your things I'll put them in the show notes is there a website or anything that yeah, you want to share yeah. with people it's, it's Patrick O'Neill so patrick-oneil.com uh, that's my website Okay. Awesome. Check out Patrick's website, read all the books, do all the things. And Sounds great. Thank you so much for your time today. It was wonderful talking to you. <laughs> we'll talk soon. Okay. Bye.